the study is the book of 2 Corinthians. And we're not in chapter 4. We're in chapter 1. So we'll finish that up tonight, God willing, and make a big move on, on chapter 2. Um, some of you I know are aware that uh, Sister Tish Clark, um, the wife of gospel preacher Brother B.J., had surgery recently. I have not heard an update in the last couple of days. Has anybody? I've not heard any uh, res results of the biopsy or anything. The surgery that was done uh, went as well as it could have, and so we are thankful for that. Uh, let's bow and, and we'll pray together. Brother Ernest, would you need us in prayer, please? Yes. Brother Ernest, you know, Brother Ernest, yes. Lord, he has a seven-year-old son, and he's a very Thank you, brother. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for your love for us. We spend this one more time we can gather to study your word, Lord and Lord, out of the streets those around about us. We're thankful for your love also for all the members of your church. We're thankful for those who have spent their lifetime in dedication. At this time, Father, we want to remember the Ernest Kyle and Chuck Heller, who sat for a long time. Good, good man, Father, in the last days, and that you come to him and his family. Peace out there now. Be with us as we study tonight. Be with Brother Roger as he directs his class. Or we must learn much from him that will help us as we engage with the rabbi and teach him God. Forgive our sins. We pray in Jesus' name. There was a history between Paul and the church in Corinth. He had gone there to preach the gospel. And as a result of that, some individuals obeyed the gospel and the congregation was established. Paul had written a couple of letters to them prior to this letter. And as we read last week in chapter 1, he describes the God of heaven as the God of all comfort. And, and made the point that as God comforts us, then that helps us or allows us to be prepared to comfort others. Now Paul had had plans and he had told the brethren there that he planned to come back and visit them. Later on in this book, as we read last week, he's going to tell them, I'm, I'm coming and it's going to be my third time. Well, some of them may have been wondering, well, Paul, why haven't you come? You said you were going to come. You haven't come. What's up with that? And he's going to reveal. He's going to give a specific answer to that question. I want to spend quite a bit of time tonight working in, in our booklet uh, with the questions as we work through the text. I think the one that we finished on last week was number eight on page number six. But now then, if you go back and look with me at and verse number 15 of chapter one, Paul says, and in this confidence I was minded to come. That is, I had intended to come unto you before that you might have a second benefit. Now, does anybody's Bible have written in the margin any definition or meaning or spelling of anything for that word benefit? Yeah, it's the same word that's translated in many verses as grace. And so we're asking the question in our booklet, Paul doesn't specify what that benefit was, but it was something that would be helpful to them if Paul was present with them. And so we're asking, what possibly could that have been? What benefit could that have been? We said, well, it was beneficial, but anything specific come to mind? Well, hold your place here. Look over in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And it's not a certainty that it's the same thing about which he writes to the church in Rome. But it could be. In chapter 1 and verse 10, he appeals to them to 
pray for him that he might at long last come to them. Verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established or, or confirmed or strengthened. So here Paul says, I, I would like to come. And, and one of the reasons is so that I might give you a spiritual gift, which sounds like a miraculous gift, which we know was passed on to the disciples only when the apostles did what? Laid their hands on them. So that's possibly what Paul has in mind in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. That by being with them, he could lay his hands on them and, and they could get additional miraculous gifts. They already had those to some extent. Or perhaps it's just a general idea. You might remember over in the book of Acts, it tells us when Paul and Barnabas were out preaching together in what we call Paul's first recorded preaching trip, they established churches in different cities and then they went back to those cities and the Bible says in Acts 14.22 that they strengthened the souls of the brethren. They, they established or strengthened them. So there's that possibility as well. Simply by Paul being with them and expressing his love for them his offering to help them, his preaching. But whatever it was, we know this. Paul is making it clear at different places in this letter that he really cared about the church in Corinth. Not just because he's the one who got it going, but he really cared about those people. Okay? Now, look at the next question. We'll talk through this for just a moment. I'm sorry. I said Acts 14.22. Acts 14.22. In the message of chapter 1, 17 through 20, what would you say is the main point Paul's trying to establish about his plans? Well, let's just read that, okay? And if the teacher would get back in 2 Corinthians, that would be wonderful. All right, verse 17. When I therefore was thus minded, or when I was planning this, did I use likeness? Or the things that I purpose or plan, do I purpose according to the flesh? That with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me, and Silvanus and Timotheus was not yea and nay, but in me, but in him rather was yea. And then verse 20, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Well, first of all, when you look at verse 17, Paul's planning, Paul's approach was not according to the flesh. Okay? So Paul was not approaching his life he was not approaching his work with them according to fleshly desires. So, so throw out that idea. And also Paul makes it plain that Paul was not being wishy-washy. Paul was not being flimsy. Paul can't make up his mind. He said, no, the intention was to come. But let me ask you this question. Did the apostles always know what was waiting on them in the future? No, they didn't. You say, well, well, they're apostles. Well, because they were apostles, each time they opened their mouth to preach or took a pen to write, they were guided by the Holy Spirit. But when it came to knowledge of other activities, they didn't know everything was going to happen. You might remember when Paul wrote the book of 1 Timothy. He said, Timothy, I'm hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry long, I'm writing so you can know how to behave. Paul said, I've got a plan. Now, whether or not that's going to happen, he said, I don't know. That wasn't a shortcoming on Paul's part. 
It's simply a reality that when it came to the apostles' own personal lives, the Holy Spirit didn't jump into their mind and make their choices for them. And the Holy Spirit did not tell them everything that was going to happen. You might remember in one case, Paul said, well, I'm going up to Jerusalem and I know this. The Holy Spirit says, wherever I go, I'm going to face afflictions. What was that going to be on Tuesday night? Or was it going to be on Thursday morning? In what form? Paul didn't know those things. And so the answer then on number 11 is, no, they didn't know everything that was going to happen. Because it wasn't God's will to reveal those things. You say, well, they knew some things about the future. They predicted that when Jesus comes, this is going to happen and that's going to happen because those things were revealed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, again, we're back to that question. Well, Paul, why haven't you come back? Some may have just been one, hey, we've missed you. Where are you? Some may, you know, we mentioned last week, some did not seem to be supportive of Paul as an apostle. And some may have even thrown out the idea, well, I guess he's just afraid to come here and deal with us. Well, let's look at verse 23. Here's your answer, y'all. Why hasn't Paul returned? Why has he delayed his going? Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you, I came not as yet unto court. Do you want to know why I have not yet come back? It's not, it's not for me. It's to spare you. What would that mean for him to spare them? Yes, he's allowing them time to correct what needs to be corrected. Now, you, you might remember uh, some language that he used when he wrote what we call 1 Corinthians. And basically it says, do you want me to come with a rod? Or do you want me to come with love? It's up to y'all. And so he is, in our language, giving them some space to get their act together. Now, not speaking about the church in Corinth, but in general, over in 2 Peter chapter 3, as Peter's writing about the final coming of the Lord, he said the long-suffering of God is salvation. I think the meaning is, Every day that Jesus does not come back, what does that give lost people in the world the opportunity to do? To be saved. Get, get, get out of darkness and into the light. In the same way, Paul's delay in going back to court, although he really wanted to go, was to give them an opportunity to set their affairs in order. And I think we read last week at the end of chapter 12 in this letter, he's very straightforward. He said, look, when I get there and those who are living immorally have not repented, he said, we, we will deal with that. So here's this time giving them opportunity to, to get things in order. Paul never looked at himself as the head of the church. Do you know why? Because he wasn't the head of the church. <laughs> It wasn't the head of the church. Jesus did. He never looked at himself as a dictator. He never looked at himself as a boss man. Now he had authority. He had authority delegated to him from Jesus through the Holy Spirit. But look at your Bible in the last verse in, in chapter 1. It, to me, this is a powerful statement. Not for that we have dominion over your faith. Paul says we're not claiming to have dominion. Anybody's Bible have a footnote there on the word dominion? It's the idea of being Lord over. Like when the Bible says that Jesus is Lord of Lords, it's that word. Okay, He says we're not claiming to be your rulers, but we're helpers or fellow workers of your what? Joy. Paul wanted them to be people of joy. And he wanted their joy to be based in what? Their relationship with the Lord. You might remember the book of 1 John. 1 John 1 and verse 4, John basically says, 
we're writing so that your joy may be full. There may have been somebody over there in Corinth who's, who's spreading the message. You know, Paul, he doesn't even really care about us. You can't read the book of 2 Corinthians and come away with the idea that Paul didn't care about. He said, number one, we're not your rulers. We don't have dominion. Number two, we want your, your joy. We're fellow helpers or workers of your joy. And then he said, you stand by what? By faith. Well, by whose faith would they stand? Their own faith. Could Paul encourage? Yeah. Could Paul be a good example? Yes. Could Paul give them inspired messages from, from the God of heaven? Absolutely. But when all said and done, it's going to be down on them to have faith. So the answer then on number 13 in his working relationship with those three things. Paul and others did not have dominion over them, right? Number two, they were fellow workers or fellow helpers. You know, that's, that's really a language that, that really paints a picture. This idea of one body, one team, one workforce, and, and, and we work together for God's glory. And you know, if we don't care who gets the credit, we can accomplish a lot. And we can do a lot of things. And then the final point, by faith, you stand. Now there's a statement that's found in the New Testament three times. And that statement is, the just shall live by, you fill in the last word, faith. Now, when you read that statement, the just shall live by faith, in your mind, if you want to say instead of just, righteous, it's the same meaning. It's the same Greek word behind righteous and just. Now here's what's interesting about that statement. The just or the righteous shall live by faith. The first time that statement is found in the Bible is in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. And there it's got one additional word. You know what it is? I'll tell you. The just shall live by his faith. You know, mama can help. But mama can't make my choices for me. Right? My spouse can help. My friend can help. But they can't make my choices. And so Paul, as you come to the end of chapter 1, there's no doubt that in his heart, Paul wants what's best for them. You know what you call that? That's agape love. When you want what's best for another person, that's agape love. Okay, now, Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is not uh, lengthy. And if you just take a glance there on page 7 of our booklet, we've got a real simple overview of it. Verses 1 to 11, forgive the, and I'm going to say it this way, y'all, you can snicker, the erring brother. Okay? Verses 12 and 13, Paul in Troas. And then the last section, triumph in the Christ and certain smells or aromas. We'll see what those aromas are about. Well, I've just got some, some bullet points here. When Paul wrote what we call 1 Corinthians, there was one particular brother in the congregation who was living immortally. There's one, his name's not given, but his circumstance is spelled out in 1 Corinthians 5. And Paul instructed the church, he said, now here's the way you need to deal with that brother. Do you remember what that brother's circumstances were? He's having his father's wife. He was involved in, in fornication. And so Paul's message is, you need to deal with this brother. And he said, when you come together, my spirit, I'll be with you in spirit. And you need to take this brother and turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. As you treat him in such a way that his desire to fulfill the lust of the flesh will go away. And he said, you don't have company with such a person. You put away. Now, in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul does not come right out and say, I'm talking about that brother. 
But you know what? It sure fits. Okay? What he says here in chapter 2 sure fits what was told them back in that original letter. But before we get there, let me, let's just say it this way. When Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, that letter involved some strong language. And part of that strong language was pointing out to the Corinthians some shortcomings in their lives and things that they needed to correct. Paul, Paul did not, Paul's intention in writing that letter was not to make them cry. Paul's point in writing that letter, the end goal was not to get them down in the dumps. His, his intention was not to anger them, but his intention also was not to cause them to be sad. Well, evidently, his letter caused them to be sad. Okay? Now let's read in chapter 2, 1 to 4. But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness or sorrow. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many what? Tears. Tears. Not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Look, here is an undeniable truth. The letter that Paul wrote to them that we know as 1 Corinthians, that message came from the Lord. Okay, Paul affirmed in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, he said, if there's somebody among you who, who looks at himself as being a, a prophet or spiritual, he said, you let them acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So 1 Corinthians was a message from the Lord through Paul. But when you look at verse number 4, Paul says, when I wrote to you, well, what was going on inside Paul? He was all choked up. Wasn't he? he wrote with tears. And see, one of the things we admire about Paul was his perseverance, his courage, but also the man's heart, the way he cared about other people. You might remember in another setting entirely when Paul was speaking with elders from the church in Ephesus. He said, I know after I leave, grievous wolves are going to come in and they're not going to spare the flock and they're just going to tear up the flock. He said, I ceased not to warn you night and day with tears for three years. It grieved Paul to see the church facing challenges. Now, look if you would in our booklet for the questions on chapter 2. And it's, I guess, maybe a little bit different question. Number one on page 8. What do you see in the first four verses of this chapter which indicate that Paul, like all gospel preachers, was not a machine but possessed emotions or feelings just like all regular saints do. Well, what do you see in those verses? What are some words that, that indicate, well, Paul had feelings. He wasn't just a robot. Sorrow. What else you got? Shed tears. Shed tears. Joy. Joy. Affliction. Anguish, verse 4, love. And again, I, I just point that out that you know, gospel preachers, uh, they're human beings. They have the same needs. They have the same desires as other people do. And, and, and you certainly see this in the case of Paul. That Again, was he an instrument that the Holy Spirit used to write the message? Absolutely. 
But there was more to him than me write words. There was a connection between him and the brethren with, with whom he dealt. Okay? Number two in our questions, what was one way that Paul had shown his love for the disciples in, in, in Corinth? Yeah, his anguish of heart, his sorrow, his tears for them. Of course, you go back and you say, okay, well, in Paul's past, how did Paul initially show his love for the people of Corinth? Well, he taught them the gospel, right? He taught them the gospel. And now that he's taught them the gospel, he's given them instruction, but he lets them know, look, I'm more than just a messenger. I really care about you. Now, did Paul always receive that same kind of love in return from everybody? No. In fact, we're going to read a statement over in chapter 12, God willing, where Paul makes this affirmation, the more I love you, the less I'm loved. That's the way it goes sometimes. But again, one of the things we admire about Paul is his love was unconditional. That's the kind of love we need to have. That the way we treat others should not depend on how they treat us. Okay? And, and, and you know, we see that in the life of Jesus, obviously, but also here in the life of the Apostle Paul. And so Paul's frame of mind, question three was, he, he had anguish and affliction of heart with many tears. That's when he wrote to them previously. And so Paul, you know, he's just written at the end of chapter one, I've given you some space. I've given you some time before I came or before I get back to you. And he just said, I, I want you to know that from beginning to end, I care about you and I don't want to get there and have you sad and me sad. So whatever can be fixed before I get there, let's get that done. And we mentioned last week that Paul had this intention of meeting up with Titus and getting some, some news and update on the church in Corinth. And we're going to see here in chapter 2, Paul got to one place and Titus wasn't there. And, and, and Paul had the opportunity to do some things, but he said, I, I just couldn't. I couldn't stay. Because I had to find out from Titus what's going on down there in Corinth. Not so Paul could tear him apart just so he could see how his children in the gospel were doing. So remember that relationship, remember? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you got one father. Remember as Paul wrote to, to Timothy and Titus, he called them his what? His sons in the faith. And that's the way Paul felt about these brethren here in Corinth, okay? Now, um, there's a little bit difference in, in, the, in the wording in verse 5 between the King James and the New King James and maybe some others. The King James says, But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. And the New King James has words along this line. But all of you to some extent not to be too severe. If I said that correctly. Okay, so it seems as if there was a mixed response among the brethren there. Now, he's going he's gonna to transition then. In the past when he wrote, he wrote with tears, with affliction, with anguish. He loved them. He wanted them to be joyous. Now then he talks about this topic of punishment. Not for them, but look at verse 6. Sufficient to such... A man. Okay, stop. He does not explicitly identify this person about whom he's writing. But it's someone who has received some type of punishment. Okay? And he said this punishment was carried out or inflicted by many, or the New King James says, by the majority. And again, it's not a hundred percenter, 
but it certainly sounds like this could be a reference to that brother mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5 that had been involved in fornication. Now, Paul's going to give them instruction. He said, you've punished him. Well, not with lashes. Okay? Let me ask you this. Under the law of Moses among God's people, if there was verification in the mouth of two or three witnesses that someone was involved in adultery, what was the penalty? Stone to death. Death. Yes, both of the parties involved. That's right. That's not the teaching of the New Covenant. There were some instances in the Old Testament of the Law of Moses, not capital offenses, not death penalty offenses, but the requirement was when you whip or beat someone, you're not allowed to exceed what number? Not more than 40 lashes. That's not the teaching of the New Covenant. So when, when a member of God's family is involved in sin and won't repent, the punishment is not the, the casting of stones. The punishment is not 39 lashes to make sure we don't overcount. The punishment, as we read in 1 Corinthians 5, is withholding fellowship. Okay? That's the word I like to use. The intentional withholding of fellowship. Paul said you, you don't have company with that person. Now, so if that's the person, now watch the instruction moving forward. The punishment's been carried out, so evidently they had, to the best of their ability, put into practice the instruction God had given. Now, what's going on now? Look at verse 7. So that contrary wise, you ought rather to what? Forgive him? And number two, comfort him? lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Okay? There's a word that's not used in verse 7. Paul says you're supposed to forgive him. You're supposed to comfort him. What does that indicate has taken place in the life of this person. We're not talking about somebody in the world. The church doesn't deal with punishment of evildoers in the world. That, that's outside of our realm. Yes, he's repentant. Because the call is not going to come to God's people to comfort a man if he's still living in sin. He's, he's repentant. Okay? So now, because he's repented, you, you did what you were told. You carried out the punishment. Now then, you forgive this brother and you comfort him. And, and, and part of that at the end of verse 7, last to avoid him being swallowed up with over much sorrow. So, so what's the problem? He's repented. Well, he's grieving. Yes. He's still... He walks the, you know, he's still great. He knows he's forgiven. If he's forgiven, he's forgiven. But guess what? Sin lingers. Oh, let me say this. The thought that we committed sin, it lingers. And the thought that we've let other people down, it lingers. And, and, and the guilt and, and the embarrassment and the shame Paul said, if you don't step in and forgive him and comfort him, he may just spiral down. Okay? He's, he's got out of his sin, but he may just go down and down and down. Okay? Now, what's another part of that building this brother back up? Yes. So you've got in verse 7, there, there's three things. Verse 7, forgive him. Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Somebody said, well, I think it's only common sense that we ought to put a limitation on how many times a Christian should get forgiveness. Okay. You know what the Bible says? that What does God think about the wisdom of this world? It's foolishness. Okay. Uh, Jesus said, 
He said, I'll tell you what, he said, let's talk in a 24 hour time. He said, you want to talk about one day? If your brother sins against you seven times in a day and seven times turns and says, I repent, what are we supposed to do? Seven times forgive. That's Luke 17, 3 and 4. So, so verse 7, you forgive him, you comfort him. Verse 8, I also beseech you. This beseech is the idea of like, I put my arm around you and say, hey, let's, let's do this. That you would confirm or reaffirm your love toward him. Not just, hey, proud of you, but show it. Not only on the day that he makes confession of sin, but you show it in the way you treat him the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. It's uh, say it again. Absolutely. I've seen it where people say, okay, I forgive you. They don't totally forgive it really can. So if you look at that question, number five on page, um, I got so many scribbles, I can't even see the page number. Is it nine? Yeah, page nine. Number five, they're to take the action of what? Forgive him? What's the second? Comfort him? And reaffirm their, their love for him. You know, the next time around, that that person who needs comfort and encouragement and forgiveness, that could be me. Right? That, that could be me. And so that's what family does. Family forgives and family moves on. Okay? So up to number four, you know, we talked about that. If that punishment's that brother, then if they did what they'd been told to do, the punishment would have been what? Having no company with it. Okay? Having no company withholding their fellowship. Now, what Paul writes here in verses 7 and 8 about forgive and comfort and uh, reaffirm or confirm your love, these, these activities, these are not, I'm, I'm trying to pull up the word, these are not negotiable. These are not negotiable. They're not options. This is the way it needs to be. And the brethren, hopefully, when they receive this letter, say, you, you, that's what God says. That's what we're going to do. Not because we think God put a gun to our head and said, if you don't forgive, you're going to hell. Because that's what we want to do. Now, this was, in a sense, a trial of their love. Look at verse number 9. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you to put you to the test, right? Whether you be what? Obedient in all things. Now, it's a little bit different setting, a little bit different language. Over in chapter 8, when Paul reminds them about they had already said, you can count on us to be contributors to help those brethren that are poor over in Jerusalem. Paul said, I'm writing this as proof of your love. Give. Now that he says, I'm doing this as a test for your, or in other words, he said it's like a test for your what? For your obedience. You know, the Lord wants us to be, to obey him in all circumstances, right? In all places, at all times, regardless of the consequences. Whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, we need to do what the Lord says. Now, look at verse 10. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything, to whom I forgive it, for your sake, forgiving the person of the Christ. So, you might remember when Paul wrote that first Corinthian letter in chapter 5 talking about this fornicator he says when you come together and deal with this brother he said I'm with you and now he says when you forgive this brother I'm with you now that leads into 
perhaps a statement that's familiar. It's verse 11. He said, here's what you need to do. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, perhaps you've thought about that statement. You've read that statement. You've heard that statement. But you didn't pay any attention to the context. Is it true that we need to be aware of the devil's devices? Yes. Is it true that we need to do everything we can to keep the devil from taking advantage of us? Yes. But the question is, in this context, what's Paul been writing about that might involve Satan getting his foot in the door and, and messing things up? Again, Brother J.W.? Not forgiving. Yes. Not forgiving him. So the challenge then is, you know, Satan may try to convince people that forgiving that brother's not really necessary. You can please God even if you don't have a forgiven spirit. Not on this planet you can't. Not in this life you can't. And so in the context... That's the connection. Satan's effort. Satan was successful in getting that man to fulfill the lust of the flesh and live in sin. The church has dealt with that man. Now then he's coming out of that being forgiven, being comforted, being loved. And Satan said, well, there's no need to do that stuff. Just go to worship and worship in spirit and truth. That forgiveness stuff, it's overrated. That comfort and love, that's who wants to do that? And so that's you know his device in, in this setting. Okay, now as we generalize, okay, as we generalize, look at question eight. Why is it dangerous for God's people to be ignorant of the devil's devices? Paul said, We're not ignorant of his devices, his his methods. Well, why would it be dangerous if God's people were not aware of the techniques of the devil? Why would that be dangerous? Yeah, yeah, you let a roaring lion sneak up on you, and guess what? You've been had. Okay, anybody else have a thought on that? Easily enticed. If we're unaware, we may be tempted to label good things as bad and bad things as good. You remember in that uh, that armor of God we read about in Ephesians 6? Take that armor to stand against the devil. Do you remember what the, the shield of faith is for? And a shield was not like one of these little Captain America toys that James and whoever has. But it was, it, was, it was about maybe half the size of that door there. Where a person could, the soldiers put those shields side by side. It's like a mini wall and they get down behind it for protection. Do you remember in that description of the armor, that shield of faith is to be used to do what? Quench the fiery darts of the weak. The fiery darts, you'll have burning so it could do damage. So so our faith. Okay, so if we're ignorant of his devices, then we open ourselves up and we're susceptible. Let's do this. For next week, you be thinking about if you want to scribble on another piece of paper on your uh your bag from McDonald's drive through or whatever, on that second part of number eight, what would you say are some of Satan's most commonly used devices? Work on that for next week and, and somebody remind us and we'll come back to that. Okay? Now, the next section, verses 12 and 13, is historical reference. Paul said, I went to the city and Titus wasn't there. Verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence 
into Macedonia. As we indicated last week, Paul had sent Titus. After Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, Paul had sent Titus down to Corinth to see how things were going. And because they didn't have modern technology and communication opportunities, they were going to have to meet in person. Okay? And he got to this place called Troas, and Titus wasn't there. So Paul says, well, I'm, I'm going on. Now look on your map, page 3 of the booklet. I mean, this is easy. Question 9 says, locate the city of Troas on a map. Now, if you don't put page three, you're going to forget. <laughs> page three, you see Troas is a city there. And so Paul, we think, had been in Ephesus and traveled up to Troas. Titus didn't arrive, so Paul left Troas and went on across over into Macedonia. And as we will learn in chapter seven, Somewhere in Macedonia, he finally met Titus. But let's go back to chapter 2 and look at some aspects of this. Look at that question number 9. What are some, name three things in the life and work of Paul which were connected with Troas. I'll go first. A door was open and Titus wasn't there. How did I do? That's chapter 2 and verse 12. I took the hard one. But I tell you what they are. Those other references are there, the verse references. I'll just tell you real quickly. They're very familiar activities. Maybe we didn't always associate them with Troas. The second one there from Acts 16 is the fellow from Macedonia said, Come over to Macedonia, help. The Macedonian called, if you want to just simplify. Come over to Macedonia to help us. Paul was at Troas. He said, Hey, this Troas is kind of an important place. And then the one that you've heard even more than that, perhaps Max 20, that's where the disciples came together on the what? First day of the week to break bread. Where? Troas. Same place. That's, that's not to suggest that Troas was the most important place in history, but several things connected with Paul's life took place there. Now Paul says on the positive side when he got to Troas he was there to preach Christ the gospel a door was opened right? But Paul didn't stay there look at question 10 despite there being an open door Paul didn't remain there why not? And I think I've got the wrong verses does yours say verse 12 and 13 or 11 and 12? 11 and 12 well I'll give you five push ups into December. Okay? It should be 12 and 13. And if that's the only thing you remember about this class tonight, well, at least you remember some. So why didn't Paul stay there? Yeah, Titus wasn't there. He just he just felt I, I found no rest in my spirit. And you understand on the personal level. Somebody said, would you pick up a phone and call? I uh, didn't have that. Didn't have that. Now, when it comes to open doors, turn the page over if you would. You, you tell me. In the New Testament, when we read about an open door, I'm not talking about when somebody goes to someone's house and somebody literally opens a door, but in this spiritual realm, this open door is symbolic of what? Opportunity, a chance to do something, an opportunity. Okay, open doors. Now, let, let's say three things. What I, and the, we got a verse on the first one. We'll go ahead and give you the answer. When it comes to open doors, what do we do? With number one, we pray for them. Okay, we still do that, right? Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, he said, "Pray for me that a door may be opened." Now, again, one of the admirable things about that, he said, "Pray for me that a door be opened to preach." What were Paul's circumstances when he wrote the book of Colossians? He was in prison. He was in chains. What do you mean, preacher? You're in prison. Well, there's other prisoners, aren't there? They ain't going nowhere. All right? All right. Number two, let me say this one. Evaluate them. 
I'm sorry? No, on number 11, the, the, on the open doors. The first one is pray for those open doors. Number two is evaluate them. And one Bible example that comes to mind is Nehemiah was working with the Jews in rebuilding the wall. And some folks came along and said, hey, why don't we go down here and meet at Ono and talk these things over? Nehemiah said, no, it's, it's not happening. Or, or maybe this just example comes to mind. It may not be the best. You're contacted by a local radio station or TV station. They're saying, we've got an opening at 2.30 in the morning for a 15-minute slot. How would you like to have that? Well, that's an opportunity. But it may not be one you want. You would evaluate, right? How does that work in our circumstances? So just because there's an open door doesn't mean in every case that you're going to do it in a particular way. And then the third one is, you better take advantage of it. When you get an open door, you better take advantage of it because there's no guarantee that that door is going to stay open. Right? Take advantage. Jesus said, I've got to work while it's yet day. Because the sun's, you know, evening's coming when there won't be any daylight. So take advantage. I think what we'll do, we're in good shape for doing chapter 2 and chapter 3. If you've glanced ahead of chapter 3, uh, we don't have near as much material on the, that chapter. Not because it's not a value, but I think we'll be able to finish chapter 2 and then chapter 3 next week. I was going to mention this example. Some of you have heard it. If you've heard it before, just take a little nap, okay? About this, take advantage of open doors. We were living in, in the Republic of China and uh, we, from time to time, would advertise Bible Correspondence Course in the mail and the course was so long, way too long. Somebody read it, was, it was like 30 lessons. Well, you know, people tend to get tired and quit, so what we started doing is after they'd done some, we'd try to go visit, set up a study. Well, I got there and I noticed so there was the, were these walls with barbed wire around the top. Well, it was a maximum security prison. Well, we went at nighttime, so we couldn't get in. So the next day, I got in and I was able to talk like they do on TV through this. He picked up a phone, I picked up a phone through this glass. And I said, you reckon we could come in here and you know start a study? So, I don't know. So we went and talked with the... Uh, the department there inside the prison that arranged those and he said sure you can start next week you can come in and teach a Bible class I'll give you one hour a week every Wednesday so we did we started that work and about a week after we had been there some denominational group came and asked for an opportunity to come in and do something he said no we're full now what if we had waited for a couple of weeks and we'd have made that request he would have said, no, we're full. Now that work, I haven't been there in 100 years. That work's still going on now. One of the local preachers started in 85 or 86. And, you know, it was an opportunity. And, and we jumped on it. I've really enjoyed the class that's bound to pray. Father, we praise Thee as the great I Am. Stand in awe of Thy love and Thy mercy and Thy power. Pray we might learn from 2 Corinthians to care about each other. To have a heart that desires to help each other's joy, help each other's commitment, help us to be there for each other, to reaffirm our love, and encourage each other. Fathers, we leave tonight. May we go in peace. May we leave with a renewed commitment to live holy lives so we can be in heaven together forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.